Hello, everyone. I'm Dan Lewin, CEO of the Computer History Museum. I hope everyone is well and safe. Well, with the pandemic, our doors in Mountain View are closed, but our digital doors are wide open. So welcome to the program today. I'm pleased to welcome you to this virtual event with Steve Davis and two social impact leaders on the front line who will share what it takes to make data and digital tools drive social change that increases the well being of people around the world. Our programs are made possible through the generosity of our members and donors, including so many of you as our core donors and members of our lifetime giving society. We appreciate your strong support of CHM and today we need your support more than ever to sustain the museum and delivering on our mission, which is to go to decode technology for everyone. It's computing past digital present and its future impact on humanity. And here today to introduce the program and the speakers is Marguerite Gong Hancock, the VP at the museum in charge of innovation and programming. Marguerite. Thank you so much, Daniel. I'm just delighted to add my warm welcome to each of you today. The global pandemic has really laid bare the fundamental weaknesses in the economy, healthcare system and society of the United States and other nations. Yet, one reason for optimism about the possibilities for widespread change is this. New technology allows for directly impacting and improving the lives of millions of people globally and at scale. New data tools in the digital revolution are accelerating social development across every sector from health to agriculture, financial services and education. Today's conversation will feature three remarkable leaders who are making a difference at the intersection of technology and health for positive social impact. Steve Davis, Keller Renato and Vin Gupta. They'll address questions including what are some leading digital tools being used to positively impact communities around the world today? How can we address privacy and ethics concerns? How can entrepreneurs and doctors navigate inherent challenges uh, these tools present while lever leveraging them to bring about social change? Why is scaling innovation becoming more important today? And how can tech transform and impact medicine and health? Along the way, they'll share personal experiences spanning from leading digital health initiatives in China to transforming medical supply delivery with drones in Rwanda to battling COVID in the US. Their stories and insights built on Steve's new book entitled Undercurrents, Channeling Outrage to Spark Practical Activism. They'll also decode some best practices for scaling digital technologies to improve the well-being of people around the world. Now, as is our tradition here, I'm delighted to introduce our speakers with five numbers. Vin Gupta, MD. He's an affiliate assistant professor at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. 300,000, the number of Americans lost to COVID-19, the majority preventable. Uh, 50, the number of calls made to family members of loved ones with COVID-19 uh, since summer to let them know that goodbyes would have to happen virtually. Two years as a part-time public health analyst for NBC and S MSNBC. And one number of incumbent uh, top health officials that understand how to build public trust. Next, uh, Keller Renato. He is CEO and co-founder of Zipline. Number one, uh, Zipline operates the largest commercial autonomous system on earth. 25 million people currently serve by Zipline's healthcare delivery service, 160 plus the types of medical products available instantly and on demand, 2,500 health and hospital facilities contracted uh, across Rwanda, Ghana, and the US, 20,000 plus emergency life-saving deliveries made in just the past three years. Last but certainly not least, Steve Davis. He's a former CEO of PATH and a current advisor with the Melinda, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. 54 countries touched uh, by his work and projects, 1.4 billion number of lives touched during his, the PATH five-year strategy, 11 pages in his resume reflecting his crazy and undisciplined career, five powerful macro, uh, macro trends in his new book focused on driving uh, the forces driving so social activism. 40 years with his partner and husband. So for today's program, uh, Steve will kick off with some opening remarks, then bring Keller and Vin into the conversation. Uh, due to another commitment, uh, Keller will not be able to available till the end, all the way to the end of the program, but I'll come back to moderate the Q&A with our speakers. So feel free to add cues, uh, questions throughout the program. S uh, Steve, Keller and Vin, welcome to CHM Live. Take it away. 
Well, first of all, thank you very, very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here today. And thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Marguerite, and your whole team for uh, uh, inviting us and, and sharing this moment. And of course, to my two friends, uh, Keller and Vin, uh, really heroes in my book for the work they are continuing to do and their, uh, their innovation and with their global health and uh, domestic health efforts and innovation. So um, thank you. So um, uh, this is a, I, I thought I'd start today. I want to quickly kind of get into conversations with uh, both Keller and, and Vin and probably a little more with Keller in the beginning because he's going to cut out. But um, but I, uh, let me give you a bit of a framing for uh, the book that uh, that uh, was mentioned uh, because it kind of gets maybe sets up some of the themes for today's conversation. So over the last few years, as I was running path or sitting in meetings and Senate hearings or or uh, talking to my friends or teaching at Stanford uh, of the different things I do, uh, a couple themes kept emerging, which I kept listening to and hearing and thinking about. One is the level of, of sheer kind of outrage and concern that students, friends, colleagues were feeling about the state of the world and, and that um, you know, things were going, getting worse. Everything was seeming to be more outrageous day after day and, and, you know, and trying to struggling and feeling paralyzed by that. And then the second is this sort of sense of, I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know how to engage. I don't even know what to do with it to, to make a difference anymore. And so I kept thinking about those two questions and, and issues and saying, wait a minute, actually my experience and more, more importantly, um, data and facts and literature and experience actually shows that those are, that's not necessarily true. That in fact, if you look at um, what I like to say, looking at the trend lines of the world, not the headlines in the media, that actually many things are actually getting better. And there's a lot of room for momentum and opportunity and, and even uh, you know, areas where we're making a very good positive social change happen at a global level. Um, and so that felt like something needs to be kind of recorrected or reshaped. And then the second is there's also a little bit of a crazy idea that the only way you can go and make a positive social change or be an activist is is you know if you're a big celebrity or come up with a total new invention or a billionaire philanthropist as opposed to the fact that they're very easy and practical ways to be activism uh, activist so um i wrote a book and the book uh, uh is called undercurrents which actually describes there's a whole water metaphor that i won't go into based on my childhood but actually focuses on what i see as five trends in the world uh, that uh, should um, that are positive, they all come with their 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 challenges and things that we have to manage and mitigate. But they're all positive trends that are beginning to shape activism and shape social change in the world in very positive ways. And those are uh, th uh, they're kind of waves, if you will, or 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 currents or trends that you could um, ride or take advantage of or be part of in the future. So if we look out the, the, over the next decade. Um, it might be useful to understand those trends. Uh, actually, from those trends, hopefully get some sense of optimism around the opportunity to change things. And then again, translate that optimism into some form of activism. And so that's the court, that's sort of the nature of the book. And it's somewhat what I teach at Stanford and, and talk about around the world. So let me tell you those five trends and then let's uh, open it up to uh, Keller and, and, and Ben. Uh, one is that the world's actually, if you look at the demographics of the world, and this was written pre-COVID, but I think it will still remain somewhat the change, it will be changed, but is that the overall, the world is actually getting better <laughs> almost by any measure. And, uh, uh, you know, whether you're talking about uh, the, the well-being, health, uh, uh, education, that in fact, if you look at global numbers, more and more people are moving uh, up. Uh, up out of the what we used to call the base of the pyramid, and in fact, the global the demogra uh, demographic pyramid, uh, socioeconomic pyramid, where we always talked about a few number of people at the top of the pyramid and countries and a lot of every most people living at the bottom, is changed in, into what I describe as the pyramid to diamond effect. In fact, more and more people are living in that sort of the bottom half of the diamond. Now that has implications for all of us because it means that we need to rethink the way 
Um, uh, we uh, don't just sort of focus on poor countries, but understand that we have at-risk communities at the very bottom of that uh, diamond in every country. And also that it gives us more opportunity for industry and business to participate in at, and entrepreneurs to engage in supporting the, the, the global human development at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, at the bottom of the diamond. So um, anyway, the pyramid to diamond effect is uh, the idea that um, the world is actually, there are many trends on the world, global health uh, trends, global development trends, education trends that are going in the right direction, but we kind of miss those with all the headlines. Now that's not to be Pollyannish. That's not to say that there aren't some places in the world and some trends that are not going well, but I think we need to look at uh, a more um, real and fact-based positive view and, and build on that. Um, and, you know, the only issue is, is there is progress, but progress is neither inevitable nor equitable. So we have to keep working on making it more equitable and inevitable. The second trend comes out of that is that the global health and development uh, uh, world was developed in a period in the late 20th century when uh, post-colonial or semi-post-colonial and post-war uh, uh, capabilities were really focused on how the global north, the, the, the countries, the richer countries could help the poor countries. Um, and therefore it was kind of a, we are gonna come and tell other countries what to do uh, because institutions were weak, there wasn't a lot of capacity, um, et cetera. That hasn't fully changed, but there is more and more evidence that communities are um, in, in control of their destiny, have more agency and more power, both in terms of domestically and globally. And, and so I call this trend that the com communities are our customers, um, or our cus uh, it, in other words, those of us working in health and development, particularly in, in the area we're talking about today and innovation, need to be very, very clear that uh, this is, should no longer be just a demand-driven environment, but, the, but I mean, a supply-driven environment, but really listen and understand the needs of those communities and give them agency and voice and support them in their journey. And I think there is a whole lot of evidence that we're seeing more and more of that uh, define the way activism works in the world. And I think that's a really positive trend overall, though it's not easy and it also takes a lot of work because of the related power and other underlying dynamics that make that, um, uh, you know, with, with, with uh, philanthropy and other things make that hard to do, but it's a very positive trend. The third trend I speak about very quickly is equity and it's really leveling the playing field. Uh, the, all the same issues that we're talking about in, uh, in corporate America and in other parts of the world around diversity and inclusion and equity are very alive and active in the social sector as well as we see more intentional conversations and programming around gender and gender equality around uh, 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 inclusion and, 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 and reaching programmatically and and changing the way our leadership structures. And I think there's a whole lot of work uh, around other issues um, and particularly in, in race and sexual orientation and otherwise. I think those are, uh, is a really exciting time uh, for, for people obviously coming out of great struggle, but an exciting time for social activists to do what they always have done, which is work on equity, but be much more intentional about what that means on our own sector. Um, and I say that as someone that's worked a lot in the social sector, where um, we need to be more conscious that just because we may be doing good work somewhere doesn't mean the obligation to change our institution to be more inclusive, as well as to do better thoughtful programs and, 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 and uh, course correct around leveling the playing field is very critical in the next 10 years. The fourth area is probably the, the last two are the ones that we'll probably focus on most today um, is the digital and data revolution itself. And I'm uh, very involved. I chair the WHO's digital te uh, technical advisory group, but I spend a lot of time on digital health. And I you know, think that net net, the digital and data revolution are probably one of the most transformative things that's gonna happen to global development and global health and well-being uh, over the next decade. Now, of course, it has many risks and downsides, and we have lots of issues to work through, uh, governance, interoperability, uh, data privacy, misinformation. Um, but overall, the ability for us now to understand, reach, um, 
uh, um, uh, analyze, give people more uh, uh, ability to take care of themselves, reach people faster. Um, using digital tools and better data models is, is a phenomenal um, trend that I think we're only beginning to explore and understand the impact. And I hope that Keller and Ben can uh, elaborate more. And then my final trend, which is sadly called the unsexy middle, um, and it's not referring to me, um, is about the, uh, the ability for us to scale innovation more and more. But we're seeing a lot of investments that were made in the last 20 years in new technologies, new innovation, um, still stuck in too many pilots for social impact. And so how to take those pilots and scale them up so they have real meaning and, and matter more at, at, at scale, reaching not just a few thousands of people, but millions or hundreds of millions of people. And, and there's actually a renewed focus on what's that, that middle of the value chain where innovation often gets stuck in the various valleys of death between the in, enter's garage and the last mile. And, and there's lots of practical activity that has to happen to help work on adaptation and regulation and all those things. So that's, that's a, an exciting trend as well. So those are the five trends. I try to lay those out in the book. Uh, probably a, a little bit more articulately, I hope, with a few good stories and, and great examples of practical activists uh, around the world, including uh, folks like Keller and Ben, uh, who um, have, have demonstrated that they're, they're building on those ideas and, and creating um, a momentum for a great social change. So I'm gonna leave the book at that and now turn it to my two, uh, two guests or to my co-panelists to, um, to share a little bit. So Keller, let me start with you. You're, you're featured in the book uh, because I think your story is a great story, but also you're featured as part of the, you know, you've, you've taken a digital platform and also, uh, a, 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 you know, the, the notion of automated, uh, uh, self-automated vehicles um, that, that can, um, uh, deliver uh, drugs and 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 blood supplies and other things to communities, remote communities, but it's built on both. I mean, what struck me the most when I first visited Zipline, it's 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 let it's almost less about the drones than it's more about the software um, and 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 the the digital uh, and data capabilities. But you're also in the business of scaling it up right now. So I you know and what that looks like, and that's it's a slog. It's 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 not as sexy as the first announcement, but it's man, when you start do it, getting it right, it's having a lot of impact. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about, you know, your, you know, a little bit what Zipline does, but also what of uh, the trends uh, speaks to you. Of course. Um, I mean, thank you for having me uh, to, you, you know, I, I think the quickest way to describe what Zipline does is just we're an instant delivery system for medicine. And obviously we use a lot of uh, cool technology to make that kind of like teleportation experience possible for hospitals and primary care facilities. But really what it's all about is enabling medicine to be moved from a central location, like a warehouse, instantly to any hospital or health facility where a product is required. And that simple idea unlocks a whole bunch of really cool, powerful new modes of care because you suddenly can dramatically reduce networking inventory in, in the hospital system. You can provide medical products like vaccines or blood or transfusions or infusions, um, second line antiretrovirals. There are a whole bunch of things that you're just not gonna typically stock at a primary care facility or a hospital might stock out of, but now you can deliver it instantly um, to a facility so quickly that actually the patient doesn't know it wasn't stocked at that facility to begin with. And the neat thing about that is it enables hospital systems to save millions of dollars by not throwing out product that might expire, especially when it's short shelf life. You dramatically increase access because the long tail or cold chain dependent or urgently needed products can be made available instantly. Um, and you also just extend the reach of the hospital system um, closer to where people live, if not directly to their homes, which is something that we're just now starting to do. So you know, th these were already trends before 2020, but one thing that we've seen with COVID-19 is that suddenly all of the people who were taking most advantage of the healthcare systems before, so chronically ill, elderly, or immunocompromised folks, those are suddenly like the exact kinds of people we now need to keep out of the hospital and generally treat at home if possible. And so we've seen so many of these healthcare systems, not just the ones that Zipline partners with in Rwanda and Ghana, but we've seen them all kind of like transform, have to transform themselves in the matter of months um, 
to really figure out how to how to treat patients closer to where they live. And this is the thing that Zipline is, you know, helping to enable. Um, and it's it's the reason that you know, over the last four years, we've been able to grow from serving one hospital to serving 2,500 and from delivering a few different medical products to delivering 160. So that's that's a yeah, simple summary. And, and Keller, tell us a little bit like the, I mean, I, I know you've shared this story. Keller comes and is, speaks to my class at Stanford every year. And he's always like, everybody in their reviews always says, can he teach it next year? And you just come and talk once. So he's always <laughs> the star of my class. But um, Keller, t tell me um, uh, if, um, what, you know, what kind of motivated you to think about this? And I mean, what was the experience that got you to shift, you know, you channeled something to become a social entrepreneur and an activist and a, as a very smart business guy uh, all at once, but um, what was the motivation to make that happen? I mean, I, I think, you know, I, my background was in engineering and automation. Um, I was in biotechnology in college. And then when I graduated, I was starting to become super fascinated with robotics and autonomy. And it seemed pretty obvious to us that somebody was going to create a new kind of logistics company for the world. I mean, we, we, were, we knew the technology enough to know that somebody was going to create an instant automated delivery system for the planet. And we thought that was probably a huge business opportunity, but from a mission perspective, we thought, you know, if someone's gonna go build new technology like that, uh, it's really important that somebody build the first logistics system that serves all humans equally. And obviously, you know, logistics doesn't serve people equally today. And as a result of that, millions of people, primarily kids lose their lives every year due to lack of access to basic medical products. And so um, we thought there was, you know, an opportunity to change that and take this thing that I think humanity has kind of looked at and said, oh, it's inevitable. There's no way to fix it. That's just the way it always has been and always will be. And we kind of felt like, well, geez, like if you actually look at the technology, it doesn't have to be that way at all. Like it could, we, we, um, we could solve that problem once and for all in a way that like humanity wouldn't have to look backward. And, you know, the last thought on that point, just in terms of, I think the path we took in terms of solving the problem is that I have felt very strongly for a long time that, you know, especially in global public health, I mean, there's a lot of philanthropy and there are a lot of nonprofits, but I really think solving these kinds of problems at global scale is also going to require social entrepreneurship and privately funded startups um, that are, that have for-profit business models. And so the reason that, you know, the reality is this problem is it affects billions of people. So in order to, I mean, for someone like myself who had you know, no credibility and no money to solve a problem of that scale, I was pretty confident we were gonna need a profitable business model. And so it was super important to me to show that not only is it the case that nonprofits can operate in these countries, but actually that you know, as a innovative technology startup, you could go and focus on really big, hairy problems that impact um, humanity on this kind of a scale and you could, you know, we could do it profitably and scalably, and we could then use money from those early operations to fund additional distribution centers and expansion to new countries to scale that service to the billions of people who uh, need it. So those were just a few of the decisions we made early on and kind of what motivated me. And just before I bring Ben in, I, I just wanna, uh, so you're in, what is it about 10 years in now? Uh, uh, nine. Nine, yeah. so you're- And really basically. seven in building Zipline. Okay, and and how and you are kind of as I would describe it. You're you're in the the scaling up. I mean, you're doing new deals, you're expanding, but you're also you know probably overcoming new obstacles and hurdles. But you're on a good trajectory. It sounds like. But uh, how how's that slogging through the middle of the the value chain going for you? And and what's any any interesting lessons learned or trends that you're spotting in that? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, to be honest, I think one of the things that was, I mean, with something like this, where, you know, when we were getting started, everybody thought this was the, I mean, I spoke to a lot of experts in global public health. <laughs> Unfortunately, we hadn't, we, you know, Steve, you and I had not met at this point, but um, spoke to a lot of experts and everybody told me unequivocally, this was totally stupid and that it wasn't going to work. Um, and honestly, you know, I didn't know much about global public health when we were starting to build all of this. And so I came like this close to sort of saying, ah, you know, they're right. Like we just shouldn't even bother. The thing that changed my mind was I luckily spent a lot of time in, uh, in, uh, East Africa at that time and spent a fair amount of time talking to ministers of health. And they were the ones who convinced me like, you know, no, 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 like 
we would want that, here's how we would use it. In fact, at the time, uh, the Minister of Health of Rwanda, who was a really amazing woman um, named, named uh, Prof well, Professor Beneguaho, uh, she basically, you know, I was describing to her what I wanted to do. And she said, Keller, shut up, just do blood. Like it would be good enough if you could do blood, you know, 50% of transfusions are going toward moms with postpartum hemorrhaging, 30% are going toward kids. It's a nightmare for us. Show us that you can do blood. And, uh, you know, we said yes. And I guess the biggest thing is like that first year of operations was incredibly painful. We had promised the Rwanda government that we were going to serve 21 hospitals, um, which is obviously, you know, 1% of the hospitals we serve today. But at that time, it seemed like a lot to us. And uh, for the first eight months, we served one. And we weren't doing a very good job of it. I mean, we didn't know how to integrate with the national healthcare system. We didn't know how to integrate with um, universal traffic management and the regulator so that they would know where our airplanes were in the airspace. We didn't know how to operate airplanes reliably. We didn't know how to do safety and pre-flight checks. We didn't know how to run our own fulfillment center for medicine. We didn't know how to communicate with the hospitals. So, you know, I guess like one of my big lessons learned is that, I mean, I think, you know, that, feeling of getting started and doing it for the first time was very, very scary. And for sure, the company almost died. Um, it was not clear that it was going to work at all. And we were sort of just working through problem after problem. But you can only see the problem immediately in front of you. You kind of can't see how many total problems there are until the whole thing starts working. Um, and so I think the things that got us through those moments were that the, you know, the team um, was, we were all aligned like magnets around the mission, which was kind of our true north. And Additionally, we did our best to empower lots of different teams throughout the company to operate with very high autonomy and make very fast decisions and not have to ask for permission in any way, shape or form. And most of those decisions were being made by Zipline's local flight operations and fulfillment teams, which are 100% Rwandan at the time and now Rwandan and Ghanaian. Um, so those were a few of the lessons we learned in that first year that were very scary, where like the company almost died, but I, I think like, you know, as, as we scale, I mean, I, I have to say, no, I, you know, it's definitely unsexy, but it's amazing to me how smooth it is compared to that first year. I mean, we added a hundred hospitals to the network last week and I hardly noticed. And, you know, adding one hospital probably took 10 years off of my life in that first year. Yeah, that's a great, yeah. In fact, the thing I try to make, uh, my editor moved me to describing the, uh, the, 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 the journey to scale from unsexy to say, no, you need to talk about it as being sexy because we're trying to encourage <laughs> more people to do it. And in fact, if you know what you're doing, it can be pretty amazing. Um, so I'm gonna bring Vin in a bit. I know you're gonna have to drop in a bit, uh, Keller, but um, Vin, given that uh, before Keller uh, uh, leaves, uh, you kind of have a different overlapping, but you're also thinking a lot about you know, how do you take innovation in, in the health sector and, and scale it? You might describe just a little bit, you know, what, what you, you are doing. We'll get more, you know, in depth uh, in a bit, but, uh, and particularly where it overlaps with this trends of uh, bringing digital and data capabilities and scaling them up uh, and how that, that's affected the work you're doing. Yeah, absolutely, Steve. Thanks for having me, and congratulations on, on your book. Can't wait to read it. I, and Keller, great to be here with you. Um, I, I, I guess I, I would love to take this in a lot of different directions, but the overlaps with, with Keller, um, I, I think, are many. Uh, so in my role at Amazon, uh, where pre-pandemic, it was really focused on scaling virtual telemedicine uh, for, for, uh, for customers and our, and our employees. Now it's really taken uh, a different shape given our, uh, the COVID pandemic. And uh, so I've been leading efforts in that, in that realm. What I've noticed is that it seems, and I'm, I put my clinical hat on here, that a lot of digital solutions have focused on wellness that are, co that are consumer facing or that are patient facing. Get your Apple Watch or get your Fitbit to stay well, but th there's friction in, in terms of utilizing that device because you need somebody who's potentially savvy when it comes to t using technology to using to understanding uh, whatever metrics might be uh, uh, being accrued from that, the use of that device, and then using that data, interpreting it, and then making whatever lifestyle changes might be indicated. That's complicated, but that's focused on wellness. And in hearing Keller's uh, incredible story at Zipline, it's, it's, it's great to see one, um, uh, a digital health solution focus on equity and, and not focus necessarily here in the Northern Hemisphere in terms of delivering last mile health. 
And that to me is the, the differentiator for what Keller is doing, what we're now trying to do here at Amazon, which is really a focus on healthcare delivery using digital health solutions, not just promoting wellness. Uh, both are important, but they're, in my view, there's been less of an emphasis on how to use digital to actually improve healthcare delivery. And it's complicated, Steve, as you know, as I'm sure uh, Keller knows, because anything that is used as a healthcare device to improve uh, delivery, generally speaking, at least here in the United States, requires a regulatory path that's pretty daunting. And it's very different to bring something to market that says this is going to impact clinical care versus this is meant for wellness and interpret the data as you will. Uh, so I'll pause there, but I, I was I'm really struck by Keller's proof of concept here. And frankly, we're trying to build on it, uh, that last mile health um, elements uh, here at Amazon. That's great. And and I'd be curious, and I want to, Keller, if you have, or Ben, if you have questions for each other to jump in, but um, Keller, you're now actually going, you've started in Rwanda, expanded into uh, uh, Ghana, you've got conversations going in other parts of the world, but you're also now, um, you know, domestic and, and doing important work domestically. Uh, you know, we might describe that and also to, to, to uh, Vin's point, sort of what are, 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 how much is the sort of regulatory uh, hurdle, uh, you know, a, a key piece of the journey for you? Sure. Um, so we, in January, we signed our first contract with a large hospital system in the U.S. Um, it's Navant Healthcare in North Carolina. Um, and our plan had been to take about a year to roll out the service. But then in March, when the pandemic hit, Navant came to us and said, yeah, that doesn't work anymore. You need to launch now. Uh, so we actually went and got emergency regulatory permission. We set up our first distribution center outside of Charlotte and started doing the longest beyond visual line of sight autonomous flights in U.S. history um, to a number of Navant facilities. I, you know, I think that, and then additionally, we'll, we'll be making you know, several announcements over the next couple of months. I mean, we, we, suffice it to say, a lot of other hospital systems and large companies are now following suit. Um, we just announced a large contract with Walmart this summer, where we're working with their pharmacies to deliver uh, to not just to smaller facilities, but also directly to homes to make sure that people like always have access, even when they're quarantining um, or immunocompromised. And I... I think you know the, the the couple lessons mean one you know we would never have been able to launch in that way had we not had hundreds of thousands of hours of safe flight data from operating in Rwanda and Ghana first. There are definitely you know the U.S. is just it's bigger, slower, and more conservative than some other countries, and so I think that our strategy of finding a few smaller countries that were, wanted to move a little bit faster really ended up accelerating our efforts um, on the US front. I also think it's a really powerful paradigm shift in people's minds because what I find talking to so many people is that we just maybe, even, especially as Americans have this arrogant misconception that like all really radical advanced technology is gonna start here in the United States and then it will trickle its way out to other countries. And this is like a radical reversal of that. I mean, you know, the largest commercial autonomous systems on earth are now operating in Rwanda and Ghana. As a US citizen, it excites me that the US is now catching up and that we're like learning the lessons we need to learn from there to make sure to bring this here. Because the reality is, although I think a lot of times, another misconception is people think like, wow, you know, the healthcare system, it must be like so poor and so broken. I mean, what Zipline finds is that actually like most of the same problems that we're solving in Rwanda and Ghana, we also have a lot of those same problems here. Like the US has the highest rate of maternal mortality of any developed country. We have major challenges with equitable healthcare access in between rural and urban areas. And you know, Zipline's mission is that where you live should not determine whether you live. Uh, so, so many of the lessons we learned in Rwanda and Ghana are directly applicable here. Obviously a little bit more complicated because we have to work with private healthcare systems as opposed to you know, where you just get the whole public healthcare system all at once. Um, but I think it's exciting. And honestly, I think you know, when it comes to global public health and where we're going as a world and Steve, what you were talking about, like focusing on the positive and the, the, the areas where we're making progress. I mean, it is really good news if advanced technology can start in some of these countries because that is an amazing sign for how they can build their own economies, lead the world, establish their own economic competitive advantage. Uh, and so I think it's so important that actually we start to realize there are investable business models in these countries and, and that actually, you know, if, if a lot more companies are trying to think, hey, like we could do risk, you know, we can do newer, more innovative things um, by partnering with countries in this way and then basically bring it back to the U.S., 
Um, I think that that's, you know, it's not just good for the US, it's also really, really good for just the economic futures of, of those countries. Yeah, no, I totally agree, Keller. That in fact, I think even in COVID, we've seen a, a huge amount of activity. We were talking about it earlier of where, you know, things that we've been working on in other countries are now sort of ex coming back home. And it's kind of turned the, 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 the understanding of this upside down, which is a good thing. We actually, it's overdue. Um, there are a couple, I know you got to go, but I, there are a couple of questions. And then I'll, I want to talk more about COVID with you, Vin, but uh, that I want to maybe get to that I, it's sort of inevitable, I guess. And uh, the questions uh, for you, uh, Keller, around Zipline. One is just, not describe, I'm sure it's a lot of detail, but sort of the regulatory space, particularly with you've got drones now in urban and rural settings, et cetera. And then, you know, to some degree, I think it's important to, and I could answer the second question myself, but it's about the way to which would we need a drone, but for the shape of the infrastructure in, uh, in, in Ghana and Rwanda in terms of its transportation infrastructure. Um, but I think, you know, to some degree, you're making this, the case already that, look, we have a great transportation industry infrastructure in North Carolina, and we're using them there. But, but you might uh, try to answer both of those questions before you wrap up. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I think that from a regulatory perspective, yeah, like had I known, you know, sometimes there are problems where like, had you known how complicated and hard it was going to be before you got started, maybe you wouldn't have done it at all. Like, I think there are certain problems where a little bit of naivete may be a requirement <laughs> to start working on the problem. And I, I definitely think we were probably pretty naive about the complexity of like working at the intersection of healthcare and aviation. <laughs> like, you know, if you wanted to avoid regulation, that would not be the place to start. So yeah, I mean, we've just had to learn you know, we've had to deal with it. We've had to build close partnerships with regulators, both from a healthcare and aviation perspective. Um, we've definitely found that our, you know, civil aviation authorities that we partner with are definitely more innovative and like forward looking than people give them credit for. Um, there is a lot of bureaucracy and, you know, slow movement, but I think the challenge is just as long as, I mean, I think we've really tried hard um, to focus on use cases that are so important that basically nobody can deny that we need to find a regulatory pathway. So it really helps Zipline that every flight is potentially saving a human life. It make, it clarifies it for everybody. Because when we're talking to a regulator and we say, hey, you know, there is this, you know, there's a one in a million chance that when the plane's flying, we're gonna have a mission failure and the plane may need to do like a safety landing in a random place. And then, you know, there's and then one in 10,000 of, you know, those safety landings may result in a human getting injured. And, but like, there's a 50% chance that that mom's not gonna survive if we don't get blood delivered to her right now. Like even a risk averse regulator um, tends to say like, we get it, let's go. Um, and so I have to say like, that does give me a lot more faith kind of in humanity. And I, I think it's, you know, I think it's cool. And I think it shows that it is possible to do innovative things, even in an industry like healthcare where people tend to think we're like so slow and so ossified. Um, and, you know, and again, like the other neat thing is that we can set precedents in smaller, faster moving countries and then apply those precedents in countries that might be a little bit more conservative or slower moving. Um, and yeah, to speak to the second part of your question about, uh, you know, the, the differences between countries. I mean, I, I actually think that, you know, a, a book I um, read recently that I really loved, Factfulness, uh, talks a lot. I mean, one of the theses of the book, which I'm sure you've read, Steve, is, uh, is just that they, actually these differences are less pronounced than you would think. Um, you know, uh, there's a really cool website, I think it's called Dollar Street, uh, that kind of really makes this point, just showing like what people's lives look like across incomes and across geographies. And you really realize like these differences are overstated. Um, and the reality is most of these healthcare systems are facing like similar kinds of challenges, especially in a pandemic. And the reality is that, ev you know, there, there is every country will benefit from uh, extending healthcare access, making it easier um, to access, and especially doing more in the home where possible. Like every hospital system wants to do this. And I think that, you know, the, the, the most important thing on this front is just that like these countries, um, you know, especially the countries where Zipline launched in like Rwanda and Ghana, you know, showing that, I mean, you, you hear the president of Rwanda saying constantly, like, we want trade, not aid, trade, not aid. Uh, so I don't think he's trying to like, you know, say that philanthropy is not good, but he's saying that like, you know, these economies need to be built through like innovation and competitive advantage and entrepreneurship and, you know, new jobs in uh, technology, in, in like the technology industry. And 
Um, you know, my hope is that like, especially when it comes to healthcare and these kinds of transformations, this is definitely a place where those kinds of countries can lead and build new industries from scratch that then end up kind of permeating into the rest of the world. Yeah, and, um, and uh, you know, one of the reasons I, I, I wanted to feature uh, 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 Keller and Zipline in my book and, and actually on this and another context is that it sort of demonstrates some of the very trends that I've been speaking about and writing. I mean, certainly the role of in the pyramid to diamond world, the role of you know, entrepreneurship and moving from trade to aid, uh, aid to trade in, in, in areas of the world where this is growing middle class and, you know, growing ability to uh, really succeed with uh, investments like yours. They're, you're clearly addressing large equity issues. You're clearly, you know, your experience underscores how, you know, yes, you came in from the outside at some level, but your team and your focus was what are the needs and the voice and the requirements of the Rwandan health system, not let's tell uh -huh you how to build and 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 you're really a great example of listening to that customer obsessively and building uh, what they need not what you thought they should do um and Absolutely. then and, and then finally you know the work you're doing at scaling and taking advantage um i mean one of the things i'd uh, underscore is that you know i was expecting when i went to zip lines really really cool facility uh outside of um uh, like Half Moon Beige, uh, California, it's, it's, you know, kind of an old farm and, and now it's converted and it's beautiful, but it's also sort of where they do a lot of uh, their work. But there's, you know, it's a serious place for programmers. I mean, you're really thinking a lot about the, the way you use the data, the way you manage these. I mean, the, 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 this, is, this is driven, there, there's a tech underbelly to this that's phenomenal. And, and so you've really captured the power of the digital uh, transformation to, to make this happen. Well, once the one, I mean, the way we think about that is like we, I, I think it's so, uh, you know, th there are there are thousands of amazing young engineers graduating from like the best engineering programs in the United States every single year. And the vast majority of them are going like into hedge funds or to go help like a few really big technology companies figure out how to like optimize selling ads to people by like one or two percent. And we feel very, very strongly, like we have a joke on the team, which is like, we need to keep kids off the street, which means, you know, keep kids off of Wall Street. Um, but like, I just think there's a much more hopeful future for humanity here where like the best engineering talent in the world is being applied to problems that impact billions of people and that are just like part of the future that we all want to build for our kids. Um, and by the way, I see Vin, you, know, you, you asked an awesome question, which is, around you know, navigating issues around demonstrating clinical value cost savings to Navant since American healthcare is driven by reimbursement models. I think this is a question that only a very experienced doctor <laughs> would ask. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely, you know, working in the US healthcare system is trickier because in some cases there are like weird incentives and just structures. And so I think the simple answer to that question is that we've mainly focused on working with integrated delivery networks where you know these so take like a kaiser permanente for example or an intermountain um, where they insure their own patients so we try to work with providers who are incentivized to keep people at home and they benefit financially if they can like reduce readmissions and improve health outcomes rather than the opposite it's sad to say that like obviously some healthcare systems in the us are literally incentivized to do the opposite and then no, I, I mean Keller, I, no, no, I was just going to comment that I, I, I find it extraordinary that, I, I mean, one, the last mile health component is is absolutely vital, but um, the, vis the the foresight of these integrated health systems to say, look, let's, let's give it, a, let's see. And essentially, it sounds like you're doing a, uh, is it, it sounds like you're going live with Navante Health and you're, it's more than just a pilot, but are Correct. you, are you tracking outcomes in terms of, or are they, are they holding you to account in terms of outcomes and uh, cost savings because I could easily see an integrated health system say, you know what, we expect our patients to um, subscribe to some sort of mail of uh, mail in pharmacy service where you can just go online and go to Express Scripts where you name it. I, I, I guess I'm just wondering there the what what, what was the decision making uh, for, on the part of their uh, Navante's leadership and because I, I think it's great. I'm just wondering how they thought about that decision given all these I mean, mail in we, services. Yeah. We work really closely with every um, hospital system that we work with, and we basically put together a value model. And that value model looks a little different. You know, in the U.S., 
Uh, so in Rwanda and Ghana, a lot of our value is around interfacility delivery. So moving something to a primary care facility to, or to a hospital, whereas in the U.S., a lot more, I'd say the holy grail is around home delivery. Uh, but you know, we work with every hospital system to kind of lay out like a couple key metrics that they care a lot about that not just drive financial results for them, but also like drive the, the mission, the, uh, the impact that they want to have in their communities. Um, so a couple of those key metrics are uh, re uh, reducing readmission, um, increasing their share of specialty uh, pharmacy products, because this is actually how a lot of these health healthcare systems make most of their money. So you, you mentioned express scripts, like if a, if a patient comes into the hospital and is given a prescription for a specialty pharmaceutical product, it's actually worth a lot to the hospital if they can be the one delivering that prescription to the patient rather than having the patient get home and log into express scripts. Um, they also care a lot about just being able to like extend the the number of procedures or uh, things that pr their primary care facilities can do so that they can treat more patients at primary care facilities rather than at hospitals. So kind of like uh, as well, you know, they can also reduce re referrals. So these are these are just a few of like the uh, and then and obviously they can reduce cost by you can throw out less stuff. You can you don't have to stock everything everywhere. You can send it only when it's needed. Um, so we usually basically build a value model. Um, and yeah, we, we just signed a contract. I, I wish I could, we haven't yet announced it. But we just signed a contract with a hospital system uh, on the West Coast where they're anticipating that over four years, the plan's gonna save them $72 million. Um, so um, wow. yeah, it's, yeah, I, they're gonna hold us accountable to that. And I'm hopeful that we can, you know, the, that over the course of four years, we'll be able to do better than that. Well, I'm gonna to shift to Vin because you've got a great story to tell as well. Keller, if you've got a drop, thank you so much for all the things you're doing. I really appreciate, um, uh, uh, you know, you both as a friend. I, I, if you had come to me early on, I would not have told you you were crazy. I would have asked you to give me a job. <laughs> so, um, so um, but anyway, uh, I really appreciate for what you're doing for the world and for innovation and for, for global health. Um, uh, Vin, tell you, John, us you're, you're, you're one of my heroes and mentors, Steve. So thank you for inviting me. And it's yeah. really awesome to meet you, Vin. And thanks, everybody. Likewise. Thanks, everybody. Likewise. So Vin, you've got another incredible story, but incredible story of an activist, somebody who sparked, you know, channeled your outrage around the world on some issues, but you've applied it as a clinical physician, uh, as an expert in, you know, sort of data as we think about what IHME has done and your work there. Uh, now you're very involved in, you know, helping Amazon, but also in the COVID response, both at the, at the policy level and the tactical level. Uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, your own journey around the use of digital to make social and 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 digital and data to make uh you know make a social impact which is the obviously the topic for the day sure sure uh steve again congratulations and, th and thank you for um the privilege to join you in color uh i a lot i I'll, I'll try to focus this on three different categories here um, one is health data and in my role at the university of washington side to me uh, the other is as an advocate, and I'll talk a little bit about social media. And then the third is just the insights and perspectives I've gotten at, at Amazon helping to lead their COVID response um, in my advisory role. Uh, so, so I'm going to touch on uh, IHME first. Uh, for, for everybody on uh, that's listening in, uh, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation has been one of the main uh, modeling outfits, uh, epidemiology institutions that has been trying to forecast COVID-19 uh, morbidity and mortality figures all the way back since March. And uh, IHME's real focus has been in trying to quantitate the global burden of disease. And, and there's a lot of advanced epidemiology that goes into all of that. Lots of inputs, lots of data, working with 194 countries across the world. We partner with the WHO really closely. But one thing that, and, and I've been really involved in this, has been how do you translate, Steve, that information in a way that's readily understandable to the end user? And we don't want the end user to be uh, another epidemiologist or another colleague in academia. We want it to be uh, uh, anybody, really anybody that has, uh, in this case, an internet connection. We, we, we want to democratize access to health data. Uh, so that people can see macro trends. So what are global trends in the burden of disease across a variety of different categories, communicable disease, non-communicable, and then micro trends all going all the way down to the county level or in your uh, whatever sort of the smallest unit um, uh, in, in a country may be. Um, 
looking at, at basically at what are trends happening in your, in your local neighborhood when it comes to, to, to death and disability. Uh, so that policymakers are informed, but that, but that people are informed. And so we've really focused on building out data visualizations. And um, this, that, that concept isn't novel, but trying to aggregate so much complicated data and distill it down in a way that it's attractive to look at. And you can also understand it and, and engage with it. If you're not someone who thinks about health data all the time, that's a challenge. You have to channel that individual to try to make it real and, and digestible. Um, and so that's been one focus area. And we, we've really learned a lot at IHME about how to do that and try to do it better. We're, we're still learning, but democratizing access to information. And when I say democratizing, I mean, uh, trying to not put as a barrier some upfront credential or some upfront uh, uh, upfront training and scientific knowledge that you must have to be able to digest this information. We want to make everything readily understandable to everybody, uh, and 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 so that's been an, an exercise in storytelling, but doing so visually. Uh, and so th that's one. The second, and some people may know me from, from this role specifically has been as an advocate. Um, I, I'd like to think it's more as, a, as just a public health educator, uh, but circumstance had it that I, to me, would put me up as a spokesperson whenever um, a bad health event would occur. Anything from a mass shooting, like in El Paso and Dayton, what seems like years ago, uh, to vaping, to you name it. I'd, I'd go out and, and try to make that, I try to make sense of a bad health event or a tragedy uh, and, and look at broader trends. How common is gun violence, for example, in the rest of the world relative to what we see here? What's happening when it comes to vaping um, and, uh, and other alternative forms of smoking? Uh, what's happening here relative to other parts of the, uh, the world? And what does that inform us about our policies? And what should we be changing? And what should advocates, true advocates really be clamoring for? That requires um, a bit of what uh, I was referencing earlier it requires an understanding of data, making it, um, uh, so it requires on my part an understanding of data and the nuance, but I think uh, hopefully an ability to clearly communicate um, uh, relevant information clearly. Uh, and, and so I've used uh, social media uh, to, to, an, to amplify key messages. Uh, as an example, Get it. I got my vaccine yesterday. I'm an ICU doc, and uh, and, and I was able to. Uh, I had gotten asked by on my uh, by NBC News to do it publicly on air, and I'm I'm sort of tweeting out as we speak um, how I'm feeling, and that, to assuage concerns that there's any sort of adverse side effect profile. And I think if 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 done right, social media, these digital other digital tools um, are vital when it comes to improving public health because. You don't need me to tell you this, Steve, but um, disinformation or lack of comprehension of key facts in public health, this has not been just a, a crisis of 2020. We've had a lack of, um, effect, we've, we've been unable, in my view, to effectively engage with the broader public, both here and worldwide, on key health issues in a way that I think really draws people in and gets them to listen. And, but I do think social media is going to be a vital part of the future um, and other digital tools to, to make people feel like they have ownership, to ensure that they have comprehension and to amplify key messages. And so um, I, I know that might seem as, uh, you know, the public health component or the messaging component may not seem as revolutionary, but I think uh, I've, I've especially realized in the last nine months that maybe the greatest impact that I personally can have uh, uh, in, in, the, in the public commons is just as a communicator through digital tools. And then lastly, I'll say, um, you know, what Keller has done so incredibly, uh, I mean, it was astonishing to me, his story, and I was really privileged to hear it at, at Zipline. What they're doing in East Africa in improving care delivery, we're also, um, and, and this is my Amazon hat, we're, we're, we're trying to take some similar models here and employ it for improving care delivery um, more locally. And so for example, well, what do I mean? You know, there's no company probably better positioned at least in the United States to deliver last mile healthcare and to do it uh, strategically and efficiently than Amazon. 
And for, for a while, uh, at least pre-pandemic, Amazon had not thought about delivering healthcare services into the home, but they focus on less than 48 hour prime packages for you know Christmas packages, other essentials, but not getting your medications or getting a diagnostic for COVID-19 um, delivered on demand to your home. And, and that's changing. There's something called scanpublichealth.org. It's the Seattle Coronavirus Assessment Network stood up by many colleagues of yours, Steve, I'm sure that you know, at the Gates Foundation, um, at Amazon, at the University of Washington, Seattle flu study, and then uh, overseen by the Department of Health. We have scaled, and we're just key learnings, is there have been pain points, but we've scaled a, 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 a home test delivery service where people would interface with the digital front door at test to having or not having a certain set of symptoms on this app. And then they would get, just like you would um, hail a Lyft or an Uber uh, uh, taxi, they would get a notification of when a test was en route and where it's how uh, when to expect it under in under two hours, and then you could sort of live track it. Um, and, and the process is very uh, uh, it's, it's very digital forward, and really relies on that digital front door for people to interface with and to engage with. And I think without that, if they had to call in, for example. Um, or make an appointment with their provider and go through and ha and if there was if the usual friction of healthcare consumption was present, I don't know if they would necessarily engage. But it's that digital front door that was really helpful. Um, I, I, I to avoid talking too much, I will say uh, briefly, and I'm happy to expand on this. We're really focused on remote monitoring of patients uh, with COVID-19 or other chronic critical illnesses. So. Yeah, but, but this, is the, this is the bit that I was speaking about earlier, Steve, on how digital health tools, in my opinion, have been very focused on wellness because that's, that's easy to market um, and less so on actually improving care outcomes that are, that are uh, yeah. demonstrable. Uh, so remote monitoring is one piece. And then lastly, I'll say virtual telemedicine, not only what we're doing at Amazon, but every health system across the country, how we are gonna consume care Primary care is fundamentally changing, um, and it's going to be much more telemedicine uh, focused, home delivery focused. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ben. I, I we'll open it up to questions for the audience in a few minutes. But a, a couple of thoughts. One is, uh, you know, again, I think that the, what Ben's story and his his impact is really a demonstration of, you know, how there is a way to actually you know, practically use tools that we have at our, you know, at our fingertips to, to have social impact uh, in, in somewhat uncharacteristic ways. I mean, in, in, I write in my book a little bit about, you know, who knew that, you know, that everybody uh, would start understanding what it meant to flatten the curve. Um, but that became a ubiquitous term of, of reference in this country and other places in the world. And that's because data visualization and the work that you did to take, and you and others have done to take what we had that, at, at, you know, we had that function, but now it's actually become, you know, the way we think about things and, and term things. So I want to talk about something, uh, you know, there's so much you just said around misinformation. I will thank you for getting a vaccine and I hope you're, you're feeling better uh, or good or okay. Um, but, um, but I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about sort of COVID. Uh, you're, you've become quite a, you've spent a lot of the last uh, year both just full, full on. I mean, on policy side, uh, you're in the clinic and the ICU, ex working with patients and families. You're, you're um, thinking about the tools and technologies. I, I wrote recently, and I actually was on the phone this morning with Dr. Tedros of the WHO about it, you know, that, that COVID has become sort of a digital pandemic. It's, uh, you know, on the one side, we're all, you know, using these tools like we are right now and, and going to school online and having family weddings and seders online and, you know, and, 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 and then in health, it's just been ubiquitous that we're, you know, telemedicine, uh, you know, remote tools, remote access, uh, giving people um, uh, better, um, you know, the testing and tracing apps and all of that. So it's, it's been phenomenal to see the, the level of innovation and commitment. That said, it's also exposed some of the dark side or the challenges. Um, the, it's pretty incoherent who gets what when, 
uh, very little understanding of what are the underlying rules of the road, uh, you know, in terms of privacy, in terms of interoperability, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, of um, uh, any kind of sort of framework for governance. Um, it, it's very, very hard for it, you know, it showed the divide that the countries and communities that needed it the most were getting at the, le the, the, the least. And so I guess I'd, I'd be curious, you know, if what you're, you're more in the trenches than I um, what do you think the uh, path forward is coming, you know, sort of out of the next phase of COVID and beyond COVID that what, what we might be doing in the digital ecosystem to change that um, incoherency? Well, I think, so, uh, Steve, uh, uh, I mean, you nailed it. Uh, at, at the policy landscape and people's mental models for how to use digital tools to improve care delivery has lagged behind the innovation. Um, and, and so for, as an example, until it took three months into the pandemic for CMMS to change guidelines on how um, a patient could, uh, could secure a COVID-19 test in a tele-environment, meaning uh, up until May 1st, you actually had to have a broadband connection and ideally a smartphone to see your provider on the other side if you were requesting a COVID-19 test or a prescription to be filled for once, so you could go to say a clinic or a drive-through. You actually needed to interface with that uh, with, with that provider uh, uh, face to face. You needed to have FaceTime or some sort of capability. That finally changed when people said, "Oh wow! Oh by the way, the most affected communities um, are, are communities of color, where there's socio-demographic limitations um, uh, or socio-economic uh, limitations to, to getting some of those technologies and, and the people who need it." in their hands to access telemedicine. So that's one. I, I think the, the inequity piece here is, is really key that digital health solutions as they exist right now often don't, um, uh, uh, aren't in the hands of the people who need them the most. Uh, uh, what I will say is on the healthcare delivery side in the inpatient setting, and then as you transition somebody from the inpatient to the outpatient setting, most docs are just not familiar with or are not convinced yet uh, on how you can use a device to truly bend the cost curve, so to speak, that if I were to use this device, is that actually going to do something for, for a patient, a remote device, for example, that can monitor heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation at home? Does that actually allow for somebody who maybe flips back and forth between the emergency room and their home? It does using that device and all the cloud infrastructure and interoperability with an EHR, does that actually are, uh, convince me that that actually improves clinical outcomes versus them calling and saying, I don't feel well? There's just not data yet. Uh, and, and that was one of the questions I had for Keller was, I, I, was, I was fascinated with, with his pilot and or what they're doing with Amante Health, not a pilot, because most digital health solutions to improve care delivery lack clinical outcomes data that can justify an investment in whatever it may be as being cost savings. Um, and, and so that's that to me, oh, oh, there's pilots happening as we speak across the country for these remote sensing devices for vital sign monitoring. Uh, and, and so I think that's this is gonna change, but we need that evidence base, Steve, before I think health systems are gonna adopt these solutions writ large, and then they're gonna undertake the huge capital infrastructure to say, okay, let me make sure all our EHRs are interoperable with, uh, uh, with, with a remote sensing device that can provide meaningful information into a patient's medical chart so a provider can actually see that and make decisions. That just doesn't exist, that connected tissue yet, but I think that's going to change. Yeah, well, I'm going to turn it over to Marguerite, but I think the two comments are really uh, important, and it's something that I am working on with my multiple hats and many organizations that with, is one is the value proposition question and demonstrating this evidence, not just on clinical outcomes, but on productivity measurements and uh, speed to delivery and things like that. So I think one is we've just still making too many assumptions that people get it when they don't and that we right. may not. And then the second is, um, I, you know, and sometimes I would say this particularly 
it to an audience that's probably has some orientation towards Silicon Valley, something that Silicon Valley sometimes doesn't like to hear. But here is an example, I think, in COVID that we're getting more and more people believe that the lack of policy, the lack of regulatory guidance is actually thwarted the innovation rather than expanded it. And, and so we're going to have to be smart how we balance that. But we're seeing the lack of, you know, the, the lack of underlying rules of the road actually um, uh, slow folks down, confuse people in in this last eight, six to nine months that I think we need to think now how to take this moment and change. But over to you, Marguerite, and let us uh, to, yeah. to help uh, uh, field questions with the audience. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Vin and Steve uh, and Keller as well for this incredible conversation. First question uh, goes to you, Steve, and that is, uh, can you uh, give us a window into your world and what you are doing right now that helps us understand uh, some of the cutting edge applications for technologies around digital health in China and other areas where you're working. What are some of the best practices and what can we see uh, in terms of what's going on now, what's on the horizon? Yeah, so I, I wear multiple hats for better or for worse, um, uh, you know, uh, um, including my uh, teaching at Stanford and writing and, and others. But I the sort of two categories would be one on a lot of uh, leadership in digital health, uh, the global health ecosystem or, and, and development ecosystem about digital. And then I also am currently the uh, interim director for the Gates Foundation in their China program. I have a background there and I've worked closely with them. So as I go through a transition in China and the China strategy, and it is interesting where those overlap. Let me just say, I, I'd say from a practical perspective, you know, one of the things that on the less related to China per se, but one of the, um, uh, main, you know, questions we're having, struggling with is, again, this sort of how do you handle this sort of world where there's so much invention and there's so much application, but there's not a clear value proposition at times. There's no clear vetting mechanisms. There's very few quality uh, standards. There's not any regulatory environment for most of these tools. And yet there's a limited amount of capacity and money to, to receive them in particularly lower and lower middle income communities and countries. And what is the mechanism we need to translate, to, to, to create that? And, and so that becomes sort of a, we did a, a we created a clearinghouse which was very low tech, but high value to start at least aiding communities that were saying that we're trying to find applications over Twitter. Uh, and this is, I'm talking ministries of health of countries uh, to figure out what tools they might be able to use to help them get through the pandemic. And so, um, you know, increasingly it's sort of like, how do we organize all this? How do we structure it? But how do we not disincentivize um, uh, commercial and, uh, and players and entrepreneurs from um, making, you know, helping us solve these problems by creating digital public goods that are commercially viable digital public goods. And so that's that's the thing. On the China side, so China's doing some amazing things in this area as well. I mean, very much on AI, uh, one of the applications that Tencent uh, came up with for tracking and tracing has been very, very well regarded and used. Um, obviously, there are certain communities that won't, you know, have a different tolerance for the kind of, um, uh, kind of tool that's going to be appropriate for their political or system them or their community values, but uh, China's had some very good successes and of course has suppressed the virus um, uh, in a way that's unlike almost any other country in the world. There's just, I mean, my team in China is back to work. No one wears the, needs to wear a mask. Everybody's working. There's no, no, no pandemic there anymore and the economy's back on uh, working. So, um, you know, that's, a, it's a, and so what, um, one of the things what I'm spending a lot of time on is actually the vaccines from China, um, uh, you know, in, in my Gates job is like, say, so they've, they've actually developed vaccines. They're, be, um, they're yet to be pre-qualified by the WHO, but they're probably on a journey for that. But how do they fit into the global um, uh, vaccine uh, uh you know, sort of roadmap, uh, uh, and there's it's a very complicated set of issues, and then also how do some of the uh, tools, the PPE, the diagnostics, and other tools that uh, China has developed for their own management of that pandemic? Could we, what are what lessons when we learn? What do we access, uh, and how do we be you know kind of quite practical again about um, the taking advantage of that partner? Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next is for you, Vin. This is around uh, the role of government. And uh, it says, could you talk about the public investment in epidemiology and quantitative disease data by organizations like the NIH and the CDC 
What's been the role of um, public investment and in infrastructure uh, on the positive side? And then also uh, with your work in COVID, you've um, spoken out about the potential negative uh, effects of uh, when government has been less effective. Um, drawing on those, um, what comments would you have, especially that might be applicable for the incoming administration and the role of government for, for health? Wow, well, um, small, small question. <laughs> I'm <writing several> uh, together. <laughs> I'll um I, I'll try to be concise. I uh, I, I think I, so on the first uh, on data infrastructure for health um, in the United States and uh, just all the confusion and the, the muddled mess the, of the last nine months. You know, one thing I will say is uh, there there needs to be all of the data that at the local and the county levels that um, gets accrued on say hospitalizations or on local burden of disease across a variety of different categories. That needs to be housed at CDC and um, it needs to be uh, completely free of political interference, which uh, the type in which we saw a few months ago where HHS was now owning that data, not necessarily HHS directly and sort of circumnavigating it going to CDC directly um, because political interference and data collection is um, Perhaps there's no um, more dangerous type of interference than, than actually clouding visibility and transparency on data. Um, I do think our uh, IT infrastructure needs to change. Um, and, and I'll say this, I'll give an example of, of why. Uh, there isn't enough real-time uh, visibility, and this goes back to what I was talking about with IHU and data visualizations for the people. If you're a hospital administrator in say Chicago right now, you don't actually un know what's happening. Um, if you're on the north side of Chicago, you don't have a real time sense of what's happening on the south side of Chicago in terms of bed availability, what size do you availability look like um, so that you can help uh, triangulate if somebody is a COVID patient, they might need advanced therapies and say uh, something called extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, you know, really advanced therapies you want to make sure that they have a bed in the right hospital in the city. So you don't want them to set up shop and get admitted to one, one uh, hospital that just can't care for them. You want to be able to have a visibility, you want real time information on what's happening in that specific geo in terms of beds, what capabilities exist, maybe even in terms of staffing ratios, what, 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 what hospitals are adequately staffed, what are not, so that you can make good decisions on triaging patients appropriately. That just doesn't exist right now. And that's impacting patient care. I can tell you numerous times putting on my clinical hat, we often accept patients when we just do not have the right staff in place or we don't have the right uh, capabilities in place to be able to provide timely care. So there's delays in care because we have a backup of patients who need a vital procedure. We just don't have the dialysis machine, for example. Better visibility, better IT health data infrastructure and real-time dashboards for these types of things will be helpful. It just doesn't exist right now. Um, the, the second part on government and what government can, can, can do better vis-a-vis -vis pandemic response, uh, I, you know, where I've been most critical has just been on messaging because I have a platform to counter disinformation and I try to use it for that purpose. Um, I think fundamentally just having a new administration that's science focused is gonna go a long way towards, for example, addressing vaccine hesitancy uh, and, and so I do think that's one piece of it. Uh, but of course, there's several other categories at the, uh, and this is more Steve's purview than it is mine, but really reinvesting in global health security, re-engaging with the WHO, all those things are really vitally important because we can't go at this alone. Right. Uh, one of the focuses that we have here at the museum is really informing and empowering uh, all of us as technology citizens to think about what we personally can do in our own lives, whether it's uh, with our, you know, personally or professionally. And can you each speak to what are a few practical things that we could we can do to be sort of activists or advocates in our own life using digital tools effectively that can help promote better uh, uh, outcomes for society? Start with you, Steve. Yeah, I think there's a big role for, uh, you know, in, 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 in getting folks or supporting people's journey to engage in shaping the world and affecting change in their community in a positive way. Uh, and, and that's sort of what a bit my life's work has become is um, I think there's a lot that you can do, you know, taking advantage of digital and data platforms. 
Um, now, clearly, we see the, the, the sort of the echo chambers of social media, particularly where it can go quite negative if people start getting into the negative uh, echo chambers and their echo chambers on all sides of the political divide. But um, for one, I, you know, I, I say, look, remind people if they're frustrated, get, getting back to the theme of the book, they're paralyzed, they're frustrated, they're outraged, you know, hitting like on Facebook is probably not the right kind of activism. It, doesn't hurt, but uh, what what more can you do? And and is that and and think about practical ways to step up and step in. And that can be, you know, it doesn't mean you have to be a big inventor or a big philanthropist or a, a full time career changing, uh, you know, activist. It can mean, you know, addressing a concern in your neighborhood or your school or your child's school or looking at um, ways to. Um, uh, you know, just shape something small and use the skills you bring, you already have. If you're an accountant, we need more financial people helping us think through these problems. If you're, you know, if you're, uh, uh, if you feel like you don't have many skills, you know, what do you care about or you're passionate about? I think people just have to sort of tap into what they can do. And then the reality is once you do that, you can find communities online uh, and safe and healthy communities to help support, you know, how you're doing it, share ideas, so I think that's one way that we can become everyday social activists using digital platforms and, and build communities around positive ideas. Uh, and I'm like with, with Vin, I think we're not gonna be able to engineer our way out of digital misinformation. There are probably things that we will be able to do through regulation and through better tools to slow it down or to, you know, to, to put some disincentives, but it's, it's with us to stay. Uh, you know, so the, what, then the, the counter is really uh, uh, is education and positive education and, and ways to build communities that counter the, 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 the misinformation. Um, it, it, using the very tools. Uh, and so I think um, thinking about ways that there's something that irks you uh, and uh, there's something in everyday life that irks you that take, you know, think about it. Well, what could I practically do online? Should I explore more? Could I make sure that I know who else is working on this in a positive way? Could I share with my kids? Should I tell my kids how to navigate this issue? I mean, I think it's just this sort of slow cascading of incremental practical steps that ultimately will change the world. Thank you, Steve. Vin, what would you like to add from your perspective? I'll just uh, layer on that. I, I do think um, having more stewards that responsibly demonstrate how digital health tools should be used, whether it's Twitter or whether it's um, a, a fitness watch um, and providing examples of how, uh, how these can be meaningfully used to improve life, to, improve, uh, to combat misinformation. To me, I, we can't have enough uh, responsible stewards demonstrating uh, the proper use of these platforms or these digital health tools because there's a they're one either confusing and a bit cumbersome um, uh, to understand how to deploy uh, for either the wellness uh, uh, health tools that we have at our disposal right now or when it comes to Twitter I can't tell you how many times I've seen I agree with Steve just engaging passively I'm not sure that's useful. Um, but active engagement, I, I've seen extraordinary examples of people, especially in the time of COVID, really step up and use Twitter to provide tutorials on everything from healthy eating, healthy living to um, uh, innov innovative ways to, to, to keep children entertained at home to, of course, proper information when it comes to keeping yourself safe from a health standpoint. So I do think we need more of that, not less of that, because I've personally experienced the dark side of all these platforms, um, at least from an information standpoint, there's a lot of darkness there. So we need more uh, uh, of the right stewards to counteract that. Uh, I'd like to follow that up with a question that asked about the darker side uh, of these. We've experienced not only the promise, but also the perils of a lot of the technologies. Uh, we've talked about social media today and certainly AI is on many people's minds what has both a, you know, questions about its, its efficacy as well as perhaps misuse and ethics. This question said Reuters had an article this week re regarding the mental health crisis where an VC funder of mental health startups was quoted as saying social media will be seen in hindsight as the nicotine of this generation. Um, care to comment and more broadly speaking, not, not specifically only about social media, but uh, could you comment about how you see um, ways that 
that we uh, people can effectively uh, manage so that the upside of the new technologies, including not only social media, but AI, machine learning, other kind of data tools can be used uh, for positive rather than negative use. I'll start with you, Vin, and then go to you, Steve. Sure. Um, I, I think on the first, I couldn't agree more. I mean, especially when it comes to vaccine hesitancy and, and misinformation there, I've seen it just in the last 24 hours that something simple like just because you get the two-dose vaccine doesn't mean that you can demask the next day. That that was I received sort of an astonishing amount of uh, of blowback for saying something that I thought was pretty simple. Uh, I, I so, so I, to me, I, I worry about social media potentially being more detrimental than helpful. One because the disinformants out there seem like they greatly outnumbered the people who are trying to do good. Uh, and then for what you had mentioned, I thought that was a, a spot on analogy that could social media be the nicotine of this rising generation? I worry as a, as a dad to a young son that um, about the moment in which he's gonna start engaging with these platforms, to, even if we try to avoid that. And so it's that says something. Um, uh, on the second point, I, I, the big concern on digital health tools is that will it increase consumption of care without improving quality? And, and, and you can look no further than a recent New England Journal of Medicine study that was published on the utilization of the Apple heart monitor on the Apple Watch and what it actually did for clinical outcomes. It actually increased consumption of care without improving quality or, uh, or outcomes. That's the big concern about these wellness tools that are not properly vetted as medical devices by the FDA. Um, and so, so I do agree that there's a, a role for machine learning AI um, uh, that, that can use some of these remote, uh, this constant monitoring that we can do with these d remote devices um, to improve one's health. But that requires significant amount of upfront evidence, uh, uh, doing research, and then trying to really figure out what is actually improving on end outcomes. Right now, we just don't have that evidence body. And that's why a lot of this stuff is still fledgling and potentially could be misused. Thank you. Thank you, Vin. Uh, Steve? Yeah, I would probably, uh, first of all, uh, th thought the last comment really important about, you know, outcomes versus the amount of consumption. And I do think part of that is just where we are on the, on the curve. We, we've got to get more evidence and we've got to do more analysis and we've got to bring further discipline and mechanisms. I guess I would, the only thing I would counter is I don't think the nicotine uh, analogy is very um apt or useful. I, I get the, the catchiness of it. But first of all, you know, this is a train that's not going to, I mean, th this train's left the station in a big way. And it's never going to go back into the, you know, whatever the metaphor I'm mixing up uh, into the bottle or, or go away. And so I think we have to embrace this not as an evil that people should, you know, put back, uh, get rid of, or legislate away, or, um, or you know, only disciplined people, uh, you know, know how to use it. But actually, it's a permanent and effective uh, new technology that's wildly disruptive. Um, but, um, but we haven't figured out yet how to mitigate its side effects. And I don't mean to minimize the side effects. I write in my book and I talked to her last week, uh, Maria Ressa, who is a Filipino journalist who's, you know, writes very strongly how, you know, frankly, Facebook is, you know, her view is that Facebook has destroyed Filipino, the, the democracy in the Philippines and has the ability to do that other places because of this misinformation issue. But I think, uh, and so I'd, I'm not, I'm very sympathetic to some of her concerns, but I think we have to look at this as just a blockbuster technology that is we are only in the early stages of figuring out its impact there is absolutely a dark and damning side of it but our job now is to figure out how to to channel it and mitigate it differently um, because it's not going to go away and net net i believe and this is sort of the case i make in the book for social impact that both digital uh, capabilities data trend uh, data model, new data capabilities and even social media Media, net net will have a positive net benefit. Um, but we've got, we're going through a lot of reconciliation about how to navigate it. So, you know, rather than getting into this dystopian or not back or forth, it's more how do we navigate the middle? I, I, I always say that, um, 
you know, that my experience and I've, you know, kind of has, I don't have any hair anymore, unlike Keller and Vin. So, uh, you know, I've been around the block a few more times and with technology is that technology has the ability to solve many of the problems it creates. And we've seen that repeated over the last century across many technologies. I mean, the one I can most remember in my own life is come, be, being involved in digital media, you know, the, the era of copyright infringement and Napster and all this, you know, that pretty soon we then were forced because of, of litigation, because of regulation, and because of commercial incentives to create very effective copyright filters, ways to track and trace. And I think we will see a lot of that start happening already. More regulation we need uh, you know, at the right level. We'll see commercial incentives and disincentives, which we've started seeing around some of this information. Uh, we'll see, um, and we need a lot of behavioral change as well. But I think over, of overall, we'll uh, I, I'm more positive. Uh, I, I heard somebody once say at a speech, they said, you know, we get into this sort of binary dystopian or not view of technology, uh, digital technology, uh, and and they came out of the, the, the medical industry and pharma industry and they said it's, but think about this way that, you know, we have blockbuster drugs every so, every very, very rarely, but, you know, penicillin or some of the big blockbusters. This is the biggest blockbuster we've ever seen in health, which is digital and data. We just haven't figured out how to mitigate and manage the side effects yet. And they're not insignificant and inconsequential, but I think over time we have to figure that out and not because this, this stuff is with us forever. Thank you. I share that optimism here at the museum. We uh, think that we neither subscribe or advocate the dystopian or utopian, but really are trying to document not only the computing past and what's happened in the past, but really apply to you know, what's happening now. And so that we can you know, navigate, make wise choices so that we can really shape a better future. Speaking of the future at the museum, we have an initiative called One Word where we, uh, as part of our commitment to inspiring the next generation, ask each of our uh, thought leaders and guests to say, if you were to give one word of advice to somebody, a young person starting out in their career, what would that word be? And can you tell a story about why you chose it? I'll start with you, Vin, and then we'll close with you, Steve. What's your one word, Vin? It was gonna be empower, but I just wrote, um, this is what I actually want, meant voice. Um, and, and I'll say that I, I, I get a lot of outreach from, uh, from young individuals thinking about a career in healthcare as either a physician or some type of provider and with an eye towards advocacy or health policy. And, um, and, they, and, and they express some shyness or coyness about, about that path and feeling like it just feels um, unreachable. And what I'd say is I, I, I didn't plan on my trajectory. I still don't really know where I'm going. Uh, but what I've noticed and what, what's clear to me is that this world needs people who are credible uh, and, and who are experts to have a voice and to, to help guide the future on a variety of issues that are existential threats for us, including addressing the omnipresent threat of pandemics and other biosecurity threats. And so we need the right people to have voices. And I think often the people who should be having voices don't either have the confidence or feel like that opportunity or that career path isn't out there for them because it historically hasn't been. And it's been for those who are well-connected, wealthy, um, uh, or uh, otherwise have had a monopoly on power for years and years through nepotism. So that's my word. Voice. Thank you, Ben. Steve? Yeah, I chose the word impact. Um, and I have kind of similarly often being asked it's too often for career advice and I'd like, don't look at my career, my pinball career to give you many uh, cues. But, but I think, uh, you know, my experience and, and kind of thinking and reading would say that uh, leading a life where you can uh, try to find ways to have impact, whether small and tiny impact on, you know, your own, you know, family and community or larger impact, or I don't mean to even measure that judgmentally, just the, or global or, or, or regional. Um, is can be a very satisfying way to 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 live a life, and so um, and there's we need it. We have a lot of things where more and uh, effective social impact is is what we need to uh, galvanize around, and we also need to channel our outrage to focus on things that we can actively change and have an impact. So impact. 
impact. Thank you, Steve. To Keller, to you, Vin, to you, Steve, I wanna thank you uh, for uh, the incredible uh, insights and territory issues that you've covered today um, on behalf of the museum. And I'll now turn it back to, to Daniel. Thank you, Marguerite. Thank you, Steve, Vin, Keller. This is phenomenal. And I love the final two words, voice and impact. The reality for CHM uh, and our purpose and mission around the computing past, digital present, and the future impact on humanity could not be better exemplified by this conversation. The fact that Steve laid out a wonderful framework, there are three things that come to mind when you comment on the world being a better place, all things considered, that's the computing past. In our lifetimes, for the most part, computing has lifted the technical infrastructure and the networking has made a fundamental difference in society at large. But the data and the digital present and the need for people to have voice individually to drive impact is fundamentally important. And the idea that we're thinking about scale and learning lessons from different cultures and different communities around the world that can be applied and the fundamental need for policy and personal voice uh, to be rolled in together is well, well represented in this conversation. So thank you all. Thank the audience. Thanks for participating. Uh, there'll be a survey for those who can give us some feedback about the program. Hopefully you walked away as a more informed citizen in this world of technology. So thank you so much for coming. And given the opportunity, please consider joining CHM. Go to our website, join and give. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.